there's just a couple more people coming in, but we'll get started in a moment. Just waiting for my cue. everyone. Thank you all for moving here so swiftly. I think that was relatively smooth. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to hear from two speakers and they're going to be talking to us uh, and giving us some information about Scotland's finances and I'll introduce them in just a moment. A few reminders before I get into that. Um, so your chairs that you're sitting at, they do have some little tables that swing up from the side. Um, so just if you would like to use them, please do swing them up. Uh, if it's not working or it's a bit confusing, uh, feel free to stick your hand up and we can kind of come and give it a jig and see if it does work. Um, but otherwise we can provide something for you to write on. So do just check your tables and raise a hand if you need any help of them. Oh, I can see you all trying. Good stuff. <laughs> only, only minimal chaos, I think. I think it's all right. Good stuff. Okay, I'm just going to remind you what some of the materials that you've brought with you into this room are. So you have your speaker sheets. So they're the sheets with the little faces of the speakers on them. And that's for you to make a note of any questions that might come up and any points that strike you during the presentations. And as I mentioned, after we hear from each speaker, we'll then be taking about five minutes just to sit with ourselves and reflect on what we've heard. We are also continuing the card flag system. So you will have a yellow card and a red card. Just to remind you what they are, your yellow card is to be flagged if you would like the speaker to slow down. Maybe they're talking too quickly. You're welcome to use them on me as well, actually. I've not use them on myself but please do um, and also a red card uh, if you need the speaker to repeat or clarify a point so they might present the thing that they've just said in a different way but I think that's it for uh, some of the formalities so I'm going to get on and introduce our speakers so first up we're going to have Fraser McKinley so Fraser just give everyone a wave um, so Fraser is the director of performance and best value and controller of audit at audit Scotland which if you don't know is the national body responsible for providing assurance to the public about the use of resources by public authorities and Fraser was previously a management consultant at KPMG so what this session what Fraser's talk will cover is where Scotland's money comes from how it's best spent and who decides and some brief reflections on Scotland's financial situation and future. So without further ado, Fraser, over to you. A round of applause before I've even started, that's good. <laughs> It'll be downhill from here on in, colleagues. So, um, Good morning, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I think this is such an important and exciting enterprise that you're all involved in, and, and I'm really honoured to be part of it. Um, the brief for me today was to try and set the scene a little bit, I think, about where public money comes from and how we currently spend it. I know that from your previous weekend's questions about money and taxes have come up, and, and, and hence uh, today's session. What I will say uh, is that David will come later and he'll talk about all the hard stuff, so if you've got any really tricky questions, then they're for David. Um, uh, and, and hopefully I'll, I will, I will he uh, help set the scene. So. Um, First of all, a little bit about us. Um, I'm always a little bit nervous of doing this, but can I just have a wee show of hands of people who have heard of Audit Scotland? Oh, I'll take that. That's actually better than I was expecting, so that's good. Um, has anyone ever read any of our reports? Yeah, so that's not surprising. Um, and at least some of you work for the Scottish Government, so that doesn't count. <laughs> um, so there's a job of work there uh, for us to do, I think, to make sure that our work is getting out there. But, but in simple terms, we are what people might call the public spending watchdog in Scotland. So it's our job to keep an eye on how public bodies spend their money. And at the moment, we audit uh, roughly, approximately, 224 public bodies in Scotland, ranging from the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament itself, um, all the way through to councils, um, health boards, and colleges, and we also do uh, a bit of universities as well. I think a couple of really important things to, to know about us is, first of all, 
we are completely independent of government. So we get all of our money from Scottish Parliament directly, and we report directly to the Scottish Parliament. So the whole point of having Audit Scotland is that we can speak truth to power. That, in a sense, is our job, whether that's uh, councils locally, where I do a lot of my work as controller of audit, or indeed the Scottish Government itself. The second thing to know, uh, and this is important because it will kind of frame what I will and won't be saying today, is that by statute, by legislation, we are not permitted to comment on the merits of policy. So when you do all go away from today and read all of our reports, all of which are on our website, you will see that at no point do we say this is a good idea or that's not a good idea. Our job is to say how is the money being spent on those things and to what extent is it being spent effectively? To what extent is the money actually doing what it's supposed to do? So we don't ever say that's a good policy or that's not a good policy because that's not for us, that's for um, the politicians. And being less flippant about the fact that I was checking who, who's heard of us and who's, who's read our work, it is really, really important to us that we feel we do a job on behalf of the people of Scotland. So we've got teams out in those organisations year in, year out, um, looking at the financial accounts and the books of these uh, organisations to check that the money is being spent appropriately and properly. My team on the performance audit side tend to look at issues of value for money. So what do we actually get for the spend? How are services improving? What does that mean for communities and citizens up and down the land. So that's a wee bit about Audit Scotland. So if that's OK, we'll get into the actual money. Now, the first thing I would say, and this might be a little bit surprising to you, given that I'm an auditor, is don't worry too much about the specific numbers. Because this is, if you want to get into it, monumentally complicated. And there are loads of different ways you can cut the numbers and report stuff. So what I've tried to do here is to give you the big headline messages that will really help you get into the nuts and bolts of the discussion later on today and as you go into tomorrow, as we begin to think, as you have been doing, what kind of Scotland do we, do we want? And actually, how do we apply our scarce resource, our people, our money, our buildings to those priorities? And in broad terms, what you can see at the top of the slide there are the main sources of funding. So I'll just quickly um, run through those. The biggest one you can see uh, up there is what's called the block grant. That's the money we still get from the UK government, from Westminster, and that still uh, is the bulk of the money. Uh, I'll come on to a slide in, in a wee while that shows you how this has all changed over the years, but at the moment this is pretty much how it works. We now have our own tax raising powers in Scotland, and the Scottish income tax accounts for about £12 billion of the money. There's then a whole series of other devolved taxes which have come through um, various Scotland acts in the last few years. Business rates are a kind of national tax set nationally but collected locally. That accounts for about three billion. And then uh, the government also now has um, relatively limited borrowing powers. Now, all of that comes through the different routes you can see underneath into what's called the Scottish Consolidated Fund. So at the very top level, those are the different places that the money comes from. It's a mix of direct grant from Westminster and various taxes that are uh, collected in Scotland. But I thought it might also be useful to focus on the money that's actually available to spend on public services day to day. So you'll see the top number up there, 42 billion, is the total budget. So when you see the budget process going through at the moment, you will see that big number. But there's loads of stuff in there that isn't actually spent on day to day services. So that includes capital spend, and capital spend is the money we use to build roads and bridges and schools and hospitals. It also includes quite a lot of techie accounting stuff, which isn't actually cash at all, so things like depreciation, that it needs to be in the budget and accounted for, but isn't actually available to spend on services. So the, so the magic number, if you like, in terms of what we have to spend on public services is that £30 billion there you see on the left-hand side. And I've just given you, in broad terms, the breakdown of how we currently spend that money. Now, for me, one of the most significant things here, and something you might want to talk about, is the top one there. So currently we're spending about 47%, so nearly half at the moment, of that £30 billion goes on the NHS. It says healthier, but actually, more specifically, that's about spending on the NHS. And that means that if we continue to increase the amount of money we spend on the NHS, in the next year or two, we'll be spending more than half of the available budget in Scotland on the NHS. As I say, I make no comment about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, 
but that does mean that everything else squeezes into the other half. At the moment, local government, which is primarily councils, gets about a quarter, about 24%. And the bit on the right-hand side just gives you a rough breakdown of how the council budget is spent. And you'll not be surprised to hear the education and social work. So ed education, that's obviously nurseries, uh, primary schools, high schools, um, and social works, the full range of social work for children, services and adults, uh, accounts for a good chunk of that too. And then in the other, you've got things like police and fire, you've got colleges, you've got other things that make up the rest of the money. So in broad terms, that's how we currently spend the money. Um, I think uh, David will come on to some of this and, and you'll talk about it more this afternoon when you come to talk about tax. But as you know, again, the tax landscape in Scotland is pretty complex. There are taxes that are um, set and raised by Westminster. There are taxes uh, in the middle there that are raised in Scotland by the Scottish Government and agreed in Parliament. And then councils have some of their own ones. The bottom two there have put in italics with question marks because the tourist tax and parking tax are examples of new kinds of taxes that councils will have the power to levy locally. And you may have seen, depending where you live, uh, so if you live in Edinburgh, for example, they are very seriously looking at, to give it its posh name, the transient visitor levy, otherwise known as a tourist tax. Um, thinking very seriously about that, some bits of Highland Council are looking at that. The parking tax equally was a pretty controversial thing um, as a thing that councils um, might be able to do in future. So they're good examples of where there's been a process of devolution from the UK in terms of what uh, taxes are set to, to Scotland and then from the Scottish Government to councils. Now, this is actually a really important slide because it shows that, um, as was said right at the outset when Donald Dewar um, launched the devolution process, it, it's a process, not a destination. Uh, and it has changed enormously since the Scottish Parliament was set up 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, when the Parliament was set, was set up, pretty much the job of the Scottish Parliament was to figure out how to spend the money it was given by Westminster. That was its job. It raised about 10% uh, of the money in Scotland. Um, and I think if you think about the 20 years of the Parliament, there's kind of three phases for me. The first phase from its inception in 99 through to the financial crash of about 2007-8, the job of the Parliament was to spend the money and actually spend increasing amounts of money. So when the budget came through year on year, the questions that the MSPs were asking themselves is, well, how do we spend the money and how do we spend the extra money that's coming? There was then a second phase, which takes us up to uh, about, well, from uh, up to about, sorry, from 2007 through to 2012, roughly, where it was still a spending parliament, but there was less money coming because we had the financial crash and less money was coming. And that brought a different dynamic to the budget discussion. That meant we had to make some difficult choices about priorities and how we spend the money. But then in 2012, and then again in 2016, we had two really important Acts of Parliament, two Scotland Acts, which were the things that devolved some tax raising powers to the Scottish Parliament. And to cut a long story short, you then get to, by the, by the time all the new powers in those two acts are implemented, the Scottish Parliament will be raising about 50% of the Scottish budget in Scotland. Completely different setup. So the third phase of the Scottish Parliament is genuinely a tax and spend Parliament in a way that it really has never been before. Which is why the conversation you're having today is so important because there are some really important choices to make about how we tax and how we spend. The other thing, just to flag really importantly, you'll see there in 2020 Social Security, so lots of Social Security benefits are being devolved to Scotland and as of the 1st of April this year, uh, the Scottish Government will be responsible for over £3 billion worth of Social Security payments. That's enormous. We've never had a Social Security system of our own in Scotland. That's a really significant a step change in the powers that, that rest in Scotland. So with one eye on the clock, uh, a little bit about how the budget is decided. The Scottish Government proposes through uh, the budget bill how it wants to spend the money. As we speak this week, at the moment, we are right in the middle of that process. We are going through the budget process in Parliament, and you may have seen in the press some really hot debates about how we spend the money in local government in particular, councils in particular, making a very strong pitch that says we just don't have enough money to sustain our communities. And so that process goes through because it's a minority 
government, there will be deals done, and eventually the budget bill turns into an act and it goes to the Queen for royal assent, as, as all acts do. So we're right in the middle of that process as we speak. And finally, a little bit more about what we think is important <coughs> for the future. Because of the way the new financial powers that the Scottish Parliament now have works, there is a thing called the Fiscal Framework, which is the, the framework that basically um, sets out how the finances between the Scottish Government and the UK governments work. Um, it's very now firmly based on the performance of the economy. So the fact that we are now raising 50% of our budget in Scotland means that the, the, the performance of the Scottish economy is more important to public finances than it's ever been. And not only that, because of, because of the intricacies of the fiscal framework, the relative performance between Scotland and the rest of the UK is really important. So the, 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 the performance of the economy is more important than ever, and that's really important to keep in mind particularly when we're thinking about taxes and where you decide to tax and where you don't. There's an absolute imperative now for the government to balance its budget. That's much more complicated than it has ever been. In the first phase of Parliament that I described earlier on, we knew how much was coming, we knew how much was spending. Relatively straightforward. These days, when you're raising 50% of the money in tax, it's much more volatile. So we're beginning to see public finances year on year going up and down, and there's a big job there for government uh, to, and Parliament to manage all of that. But finally, and really importantly, and I know this is what you've spent a lot of your time on so far, the diagram on the right there is the National Performance Framework, which is the thing that sets out, in broad terms, I'm sure you've seen it, the outcomes that, that we think we want to deliver for Scotland. It kind of sets out the kind of Scotland that we want to be. And for me, it's really important to remember that the money is not an end in itself. The money is designed to do stuff. We spend it on services, and those services should be designed to improve the lives of communities and citizens across the land. So when thinking about the budget, when thinking about tax choices, we always have to remember to what purpose. What are we actually trying to achieve with it, and is it going to help us build a more successful, more prosperous Scotland? Thank you very much indeed, everybody. That was me. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Fraser. Um, so we're just going to take five minutes now just to sit with what we've just heard from Fraser there and to think about that, reflect about that. Um, you can use your postcards, uh, sorry, your, your speaker sheets if you would like. So again, they're the sheets um, with the speaker's pictures on. Uh, write on them, draw on them, or just sit with yourself and, and have a think about what you heard there. But in five minutes, I'll be back to introduce our next speaker.
everyone, can I uh, bring the room back together, please? Thank you. Um, I hope you found it helpful to have a little bit of space um, between the speakers, and we will be continuing that pattern for the weekend. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, which is David Bell, Professor David Bell, CBE from the University of Stirling. So David is a professor of economics at the University of Stirling, and he is a co-investigator in the Centre on Constitutional Change at the University of Edinburgh and the Centre for Population Change at the University of Southampton. From 2007 to 2014, David was the budget advisor to the Scottish Parliament's Finance Committee, and he's also been an advisor to the House of Lords. So what David is going to cover in his talk is a bit more detail on Scotland's budget, what the Government Expenditure and Revenue in Scotland, otherwise known as GERS, G-E-R-S, calculation is, and how to interpret GERS, the fiscal deficits, government borrowing and government debt, and Scotland's current and possible future fiscal arrangements. So David, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, that seems like quite a lot to get through in 20 minutes. Um, so, um, thank you. Um, I'm also, like Fraser, delighted to be here. I managed to get here from the wilds of Perthshire through various snow showers and so on this morning. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to talk uh, about uh, taxation and government spending in Scotland. Um, and... In particular, I'm going to talk about understanding Scotland's public finances. And this, so Fraser is mainly focused on Scotland and what's spent in Scotland by Scottish bodies. I'm now going to kind of bring in the UK uh, transactions in terms of the taxes that we pay to London and also the spending that comes from London. So some taxes... Um, so. The, sorry, the, um, uh, as far as the UK is concerned, the money comes and goes through HM Treasury, which was, until very recently, a very powerful ministry in the, uh, uh, in the UK government. Uh, in Scotland, we have a Taxation and Fiscal Sustainability Directorate. It doesn't really trip off the tongue, but they're responsible for managing Scotland's finances. So as Fraser has said, some taxes are raised in Scotland and paid to the Scottish Government and income tax. I've used a very clever-ish colour coding here to help you. Um, are, are, uh, are paid to, to the Scottish Government income tax as a result of the uh, Smith Commission. Um, fuel duty, however, goes to the UK Government and council tax goes to local government in, uh, in Scotland. And on the spending side... The Scottish Government are and the UK Government and local councils are responsible for different things. So, for example, the Scottish Government pays pretty much all of health spending. The UK Government pays your pension, if you're a pensioner. And local councils are uh, responsible uh, for things like schools, although they get their money from the Scottish Government to, make the, to, to pay for schools. Now, when we look at the accounts in a minute, things will be included which aren't actually spent in Scotland. And it's as if Scotland was a mini version of the UK as a whole. So we had our own, for example, international aid budget. Well, Scotland doesn't have a significant international aid budget, but an assumption is made for the accounts that Scotland has a share of the overall international aid budget. That's the money that's spent helping countries uh, uh, that are less developed. Similarly for defence spending, Scotland doesn't have its own defence budget, but it's deemed to benefit from the defence spending which happens for the UK as a whole. So, here's the big numbers. Uh, so billion, million, million, pounds, total taxes raised in Scotland, whether they went to the Scottish Government or to the UK Government, totaled £62.7 billion. Total spending in Scotland, or on behalf 
of the Scottish people, that's the things like international aid and defence and so on. So it's not actually spent in Scotland, but it's spent on our behalf, 75.3 billion. Now, these numbers come from a document that some, I don't know, I'll, I'll do a phraser. Have any of you heard of government expenditure and revenue in Scotland, it's sometimes called JERS? Well, well, not the football team. Uh, so uh, this is what these numbers come from. So I'll go on a little bit to explain what it is. Government expenditure and revenue in Scotland is an annual publication. So there's an estimate each year. And it's intended to find the balance between taxes raised and public spending in Scotland. Those two numbers that I had on the last slide are what it's about. JERS is prepared by the Scottish Government. It's not a UK Government conspiracy. It's prepared by the Scottish Government statisticians and they're obliged to prepare a truthful account <coughs> as accurate as possible. It will not be perfect. Uh, their, their estimate of taxes on the one hand and public spending on the other. So if more is spent than is raised in tax, the government has to borrow, has to borrow because it's got a deficit on its account. If it raises more than is spent, then it can uh, put money into its reserves. Now a country that has done that very successfully is Norway, based to a large extent on its oil revenues. It has a very large, what's called a sovereign wealth fund. <coughs> okay. So, let's see how it's all put together. So the blocks are proportional to the amount of money um, that is being raised. So the height of the block, that's income tax, that's Scottish, that's national insurance, that's uh, London. VAT is soon going to be split between Scotland and the rest of the U. UK. Corporation tax is UK. Fuel duty is UK. Non-domestic rates, that's business rates, that's Scottish. Council tax is Scottish. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's all too small and too detailed to be bothered about just now. That gives you an idea of the total revenue and that's how it's made up. On the other si side, you've got the um, spending, the old age pension. Again, the blocks are proportional to the amount um, that, uh, that is being spent. There's, the, there's other benefits, PIP, attendance allowance, uh, universal credit, and so on. UK government mainly, there's the amount that's spent on health, Scottish government, the amount of sp spent on education, Scottish Government, environment, housing, public safety and economic development are all Scottish Government. Other stuff that Scottish Government um, <laughs> defence, that's actually spent by the UK Government, but it's deemed a part of the overall defence budget is meant to be on behalf of the Scottish people. And then there's debt interest. This is the interest on your previous debt that you've incurred, and I'll talk quite a bit about that in a minute. The difference between those two is, is what's called the fiscal deficit. The difference between the overall spending in Scotland or on behalf of the Scottish people against all of the taxes that are raised in Scotland. So, this now amounts to 12.63 billion. That's for the last, that's the 2018-19 fiscal year. So there is a shortfall of that amount between the taxes we raise and the amount of spending that we do. That's based on certain assumptions, and I'll go back to those. So this is 2018-19, and it also includes North Sea oil taxes. Amongst the other taxes that I had, I included North Sea Oil. North Sea Oil is a big issue, which I'll come back to. 
when you've got a deficit like this, you um, often uh, express it as a share of all of the income in the country because it's, it, it's, that gives an idea about how much of a burden the deficit would be relative to all of the income that we raise in Scotland, and that's called GDP. So sometimes we call it a percentage of GDP, and sometimes we call it an amount per person. So how much per person does that 12.6 12, 12 billion pounds mean? So it, the 2018-19 accounts imply 7% of GDP, 2,280 pounds per person. Scotland's deficit as a share of GDP has varied a lot through time. That's the Scottish deficit. That's the UK deficit. Now you'll see that they stay fairly close together up until about 2011-12 or thereabouts. Scotland's deficit was about the same as the UK's while oil revenues were strong. Scotland was getting a lot of money from the North Sea. Then two things happened. We had the Great Recession, 2008-9. Now, when the economy slows down, less taxes are collected. And because less taxes are collected, your deficit goes up. And the government had also had to bail out the banks at that time. And then Scotland, Scottish revenues were hit by the oil price collapse. So now the most recent estimate there, the 7% at the end of that graph, is the 7% I've referred to, and it's much higher than the UK deficit because North Sea oil isn't, is no longer doing the business uh, for, for Scotland. So, why did the UK deficit come, come down? Because the UK government had a target of getting the deficit down pretty much to uh, the break-even point. It, had, it, it thought it could do it well before it actually managed to, but that's a different story. But that was austerity, and people felt that through cuts in benefits, cuts in public uh, services. So they cut the expenditure side, uh, and that, uh, that uh, uh, people perhaps suffered from it, but it brought the deficit down. The deficit varies across different parts of the UK. The Office of National Statistics have sort of done equivalent numbers for different parts of the UK, so Scotland is not doesn't have the highest deficit, but then Scotland is in a different position from, say, the north northwest of England, where you know the 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 deficit is no longer is is not a political issue in any sense. So, do deficits matter? So, if you don't have enough money, this is just like a, a bank loan. You have to take out a loan. Governments have to borrow. So they therefore need to find lenders and offer them a rate of return. You don't get loans for nothing. Governments never want to be in a position where they cannot borrow. That's, that's really, uh, they, they lose power if they can't borrow. So they need to be able to show that they can repay their debts. And one way of persuading uh, uh, lenders that you can repay your debts is to show that by and large, you don't have a big deficit each year. So you don't have a massive deficit, a, well, a debt. So each year you have a deficit, but the deficit adds to the debt. So <clears throat> so there are two ways of doing this. You can cut spending, and that reduces the deficit as a, as a share of GDP. But you can also grow GDP. And that means if the money deficit stays the same you, and your GDP has grown, as a share of GDP, that has fallen. And there's an argument about that, that was what we should have done uh, in 2010-11 or 2008-9. So 
I, this is, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you are glazing over at this point uh, with, what, with what I've been talking about and you say, this really doesn't matter to me. But in fact it does because cutting the deficit, the UK government introduced the austerity policy which led to lots of cuts in public spending, including benefits, and that affected things like homelessness and child poverty. Some argued that really what the UK government should have done is grow the economy more to add to tax revenues and uh, uh, therefore make the deficit a smaller share of GDP. So I've, what I should have uh, yeah. Um, each year's deficit adds to the overall debt. So UK debt in November last year was 1.791 trillion pounds. That's the total debt. Governments have to make regular payments. These payments are uh, on, on, on the debt. That's known as debt interest. And Scotland's estimated share, based on its population actually, of these interest payments, and you'll have seen this in the last in in in, in the slide with the with the different boxes, that share was estimated to be three point one billion pounds. Um, debt interest payments can last a long time. That depends on the term of the loan. It's just like a mortgage; uh, you can take it out over different periods of time, and which means that it can be a long time people are paying back the debt and so future generations are still paying back that debt interest oh sorry i'm just wondering where do the total money from so uh there are a if, if the easiest example for that is pension funds so if you are contributing to a pension the um pension fund has, will have a set of investments and they will vary according to their riskiness. So it will have a, it'll buy some shares in companies, uh, it'll buy some uh, bonds uh, that companies sell, but it will also have government bonds because when it actually wants to pay you or your pension, it wants to have something that's really secure to pay back your, uh, to pay, make it your pension payments. So pe uh, pension funds are huge holders of government debt. There is another issue that uh, uh, investors from other countries may buy um, uh, UK government debt, and, and that creates an, a whole area that I don't want to go into at the minute, because it just adds the complication. Um, so my, my, my point here is that um, uh, if you end up um, future generation paying for uh, um, today's deficit, is this fair? Well, if, if the spending is used to create an asset like a railway line uh, or an HS2 or whatever, then future generations can benefit. But if you just spend the money on something that uh, uh, creates no asset, then future generations end up paying for something that they really don't get a benefit out of. So, um, what the UK government um, has a fiscal rule of, try, what it tries to do is to, or we think, although with what's going on at the moment in London, uh, it's only a, a vague thought, um, <laughs> is to break even on day-to-day -day spending, but to borrow for long-term asset building, like roads, hospitals, schools, etc. Now, one of the things that people worry about... Yeah. Sorry, I was Yeah. What's like HS2? Oh, HS2, sorry, that's the railway line that is being proposed from London to Birmingham which is going to cost 105 billion. I think it's 105 billion is the latest, that won't be the last estimate. Um, 
So one of the issues uh, uh, for Scotland around the independence issue uh, and rejoining the EU is that the uh, deficit, uh, there's a thing called the Stability and Growth Pact, which may or may not be, still be in action when, uh, when Scotland, if it did become independent and did choose to uh, uh, join the, uh, try to rejoin the EU, uh, the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, the idea is that the deficit should be no more than 3% of GDP. Well, at the current level, it's 7%. But some of that is assumed like the spending on defence. Scotland would then have a choice about how much to spend on defence. Uh, and uh, some of the, it would have a choice about how much to spend on international aid. I should say that the deficit, and David Phillips made this point, that, that, and I didn't get quite into the slide. At the moment, the Scottish deficit is covered by the UK government. So Scotland doesn't need to worry about the deficit at the moment because it's covered by the UK government. It was only if it becomes independent that that is an issue. So we had uh, the, the Scottish um, um, government commissioned something called the Growth Commission to look at how to get the deficit down. And it basically recognised that over the years immediately following independence there would need to be an effort to cut the, de the current level of the deficit to a lower level and it set out a plan for doing that. I'm happy to answer questions about that later. Um, I've got a couple of slides left. Um, so. What major challenges will Scotland face in the future? We know things like climate change, ageing society, labour productivity, the value of output per worker is and are all big issues. And will these challenge, challenges make it more difficult to control Scotland's fiscal deficit? So, for example, if you want to do climate change, you need to change over domestic heating from gas to renewable sources. Who's going to pay for that? Um, Aging society, paying for more people with chronic ailments and social care needs, who's going to pay for that? Uh, and reskilling workers to increase their productivity again, who's going to pay for that? Um, one thing that I want to bring up that maybe is slightly off course but is very relevant for Scotland, if you don't want to uh, a a increase public spending, and you do, but you you um, <clears throat> you want to increase um, take up services, then you can charge for those services. And things that Scotland gets free include free personal care, prescriptions, university free fees, bridge tolls, and so on. So charges are an option instead of taxes. However, what that typically means is that poor people find it more difficult to pay the charges, although. It does have the benefit that the person who directly receives the service, like the person, person who drives across the bridge, actually benefits from the payment. So my key messages. Balance between taxes, taxes raised and the money spent by our government, the fiscal deficit may seem to have little to do with everyday life, but it is very important. Scotland currently has a large fiscal deficit, but this is covered by the UK at the moment. So it's a, uh, a part of the overall UK government debt, and it's the UK that makes the borrowing on Scotland's behalf. Um, there is an acknowledgement, I think, that Scotland would have to have, a, an in, uh, if it was independent, have to have a smaller deficit, but less agreement on how that might, might be achieved. Um, decisions about today's spending on health and education and so on will affect future generations depending on how much debt, how you um, organise debt as between paying now and paying later. Um, Scotland does uh, face future challenges and it will need to decide what role of taxation 
and government spending might be in meeting these challenges while maintaining fiscal stability, meaning deficits that are under control. And as well as uh, increasing taxes, there's the option of charging for services. So, thank you very much. That's me. Brilliant. Thank you so much to Professor David Bell there. Um, so again, we're going to take five minutes now just to digest some of that um, and to reflect on what we've heard. And then I'll be back to let you know what we're doing next. Um, but just so you know, when we go into our discussions later in the breakout rooms, you will have copies of the slides that all the presenters are showing today. So you will have some copies on your table. Um, and the speakers will be joining us a little bit later as well to ask some, answer some questions and clarifications that you have. But five minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, can I bring the room back together, please? Just bring the room back together. Okay, thank you. Um, again, I hope that reflection time was useful. Uh, you may or may not be delighted to know the next thing we're going to do is have a break. Um, so after the break, we will be starting in our breakout rooms. And we'll be having some discussions before doing uh, some Q&As with the speakers in a little while. Please remember when you leave this room to take your red and yellow cards. You will need them later. As well as your personal reflection sheets, which you may want to refer to in the next sessions. And any of anything else that you've brought with you, basically. If you're not sure what room you're in, uh, they're just here on the screen again. If you're on tables 2, 5, 4, 8, 11, at 35 past, please make sure you're in the main room and ready to go. If you're on tables 3, 7, 13, 14, yellow room. Ah. Oh. So, uh, some people... Oh. Oh, I got a lot louder. Um, <laughs> thank you for flagging that. If you're in the main room, uh, your tables 2, 5, 4, 8, 11, please make sure you're in there and ready to go at 11.35. Yellow room, table 3, 7, 13, and 14. Blue room, tables 1, 6, 10, 12, and 9. But yes, please take everything with you. You will need everything you have in future sessions. So.